ti sahanena saha pancha silani yachami tatiampi aham bante ti sahanena saha pancha silani yachami namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa 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 Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Buddhang saranam gachami. Buddhang saranam gachami. Dhammang saranam gachami. Dhammang saranam gachami. Sangham saranam gachami. Sangham saranam gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Dutiyampi sangham saranam gachami. Dutiyampi sangham saranam gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranam gachami. Tatiyampi sangham saranam gachami. Tatiyampi sangham saranam gachami. Ti saranagamanang ititang. Amabante. Pana tipa tawi ramani sikal padang samadhyam. Pana tipa tawi ramani sikal padang samadhyam. Adinna dana viramani sikha padang samadhyam. Adinna dana viramani sikha padang samadhyam. Kami sukmi chahatara viramani sikha padang samadhyam. Kami sukmi chahatara viramani sikha padang samadhyam. Musawa da viramani sikha padang samadhyam. Musawa da viramani sikha padang samadhyam. Sura meraya manja pamada tana viramani sikha padang samadhyam. Sura meraya manja pamada tana viramani sikha padang samadhyam. Imani pancha sikha padani, sile na sugating ang ti sile na bhoga sampada, sile na nibuting ang ti tasma silang sodha ye. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Hundred and twelve, Chabi Sodhana Sutta, the sixfold purity. Thus have I heard on one occasion the blessed one was living at Sabati in Jeta's Grove. Anatapindika's park. There he addressed the vikus thus. Vikus, venerable sir, they replied. The blessed one said this. Here vikus, a viku makes a declaration of final knowledge thus. I understand. Birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Bante, I have a quick question uh, um, on the main time. How a big one understand that the bird is destroyed? Um, like there is like uh, uh, in a clear understanding? I never uh, un- understood these things. When the meditator arises from the attainment, there is a uh, awareness of the difference. Among other things, it's called Pachawekan and Yana, the 16th stage of knowledge. Okay. And the difference is palpable. You're able to uh, recognize what is left to be done as well. But an Arahant recognizes there's nothing left to be done based on the much. difference between before and after. I mean, this isn't, it's not intellectual. This is real. This is a real. I mean, it's not something that should be familiar. It's a question that is asked because it doesn't seem like something we're familiar with happening to us, Mm-mm. but it, 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 because it only happens for enlightened beings, an experience of the, the difference. 
So, um, like um, when uh, somebody arrives at a stage of sotapana, he really yeah. understand that um, there is a difference between the sotapana stage and the jhana stage. You, you, you know. Yes, sort of indirectly. I mean, that's not quite what they're thinking at the moment, but yeah, they'll be able to tell the difference because of what they're experiencing in that moment. Once they've come back and once they've exited from Palanyana, they are able to appreciate the distinction with this experience. Uh, Sotapanna will not be as clear as Arahantship. There will still be, of course, because there's still many defilements, but they'll be able to see that very clearly, the defilements that are left. And their perspective on them will be very different than before. Paragraph 3. That bhikkhu's words should neither be approved nor disapproved. Without approving or disapproving, a question should be put thus. Friend, there are four kinds of expression rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One, who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. What for? One speaks of the seen as it was seen. One speaks of the heard as it was heard. One speaks of the sensed as it was sensed. One speaks of the cognized as it was cognized. These, friend, are the four kinds of expression rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One, who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. How does the Venerable One know? How does he see regarding these four kinds of expression? so that through not clinging, his mind is liberated from the taints. Because when a bhikkhu is one with taints destroyed, who has lived the holy life, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, reached the true goal, destroyed the fetters of being, and is completely liberated to final knowledge, this is the natural way for him to answer. Friends, Regarding the scene, I abide unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, associated, with a mind rid of barriers. Regarding the heard, regarding the sensed, regarding the cognized, I abide unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with the mind rid of barriers. It is by knowing thus, seeing thus, regarding these four kinds of expression, that through not clinging, my mind is liberated from the taints. Rid of barriers is, um, I mean, I don't think it's a bad translation, but it, it's basically unbounded, like uh, having no uh, limits. It's just, a, it's just basically a, another way of saying independent, like a, um, an animal, a, a farm animal that has escaped from its fencing, has no fences around it. Five, saying good, one may delight and rejoice in that bhikkhu's words. Having done so, a further question may be put thus. Friend, there are these five aggregates affected by clinging, rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. What five? They are the material form aggregate affected by clinging, the feeling aggregate affected by clinging, the perception aggregate affected by clinging, the formations aggregate affected by clinging, and the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging. These friends are the five aggregates affected by clinging, rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. How does the Venerable One know? How does he see regarding these five aggregates affected by clinging? so that through not clinging, his mind is liberated from the taints. Bhikkhu. When a bhikkhu is one with the taints destroyed and is completely liberated through final knowledge, this is the natural way for him to answer. Friend, having known material form to be feeble, fading away and comfort, comfortless, with the destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up, the relinquishing of attraction, and clinging regarding material form of mental standpoints, adherence, and underlying tendency regarding material form, I have understood that my mind is liberated. Friend, having no feeling, having no perception, having no formation, having no consciousness to be feeble, fading away, and comfortless, with the destruction fading away, cessation, giving up, and relinquish of attraction and clinging, 
regarding consciousness of mental standpoints, adherence, and underlying tendency regarding consciousness, I have understood that my mind is liberated. It is by knowing thus, seeing thus, regarding the five aggregates affected by clinging, that through not clinging, my mind is liberated from the taints. So a couple of things here. First of all, we shouldn't uh, rush over the, the important part here where he says, having known material form to be feeble, fading away, and comfortless. That's a really good um, brief description of the ideas behind vipassana, behind the three characteristics. Don't forget how important that is. That Why does it come about that you give up clinging to these things? It's not because you decide that they're bad or because you try to um, repress desire for them or you get... Uh, upset at yourself when you're attached to them, when you like things, like rupa, when you like form, or when you like pleasant feelings, or that sort of thing. It's because you come to see that they are feeble, comfortless, and fading away. I, I haven't looked. What are the actual Pali words here? Just take a look. Abalang means, that's interesting, it means not feeble, but not strong, literally not strong. All right, I did look at this. Viraguna. It's not really clear what that means. Anasasika. Yeah, not comforting. But the... the um, I don't know what the fading away part, but I assume it's something to do with this idea of the of impermanence. Um, not lasting. Not being satisfying because it doesn't last. But the other thing here is, I, I think um, this is a... There's a phrase here that is used throughout the rest of the sutta as well. And I don't. I, I think it should be better translated differently. So where he says mental standpoints, the Pali is aditana, which should be familiar to many many of you. This is the uh, word for determination. Aditana, and the other one is abhinivesa. And these words are kind of synonymous, actually, and they both mean the idea of um, wishing or wanting, like a determination is making some idea towards it, like wanting, determining, I'm going to get that. And uh, abhinivesa is something like uh, inclination. So you incline towards something. You're partial to certain things. You, when, you, when it comes to mind, you have liking towards it. So these words are used to describe the state of being attached to something. What is it like? Well, you make determinations regarding it and you're inclined towards it. And so these are the sorts of indicators that you're clinging to it. And this is what you give up. Um, if I can ask a quick question. When Sutta says that the mind is liberated from consciousness, if mind and consciousness are the same thing, why does it say that? Because there's no clinging to it. Liberation doesn't mean not having the thing arise, although in, actually in some sense it does, but it, it more importantly means not clinging to it. And, that, and practically that's a very important point, is that liberation we think of as being free is not having to experience something, and that's not what freedom is. Thank you. Sort of, sort of. And honestly, the final experience, because you have let go, is for it to not arise. The attainment, the realization of nibbana, or the attainment of parinibbana. But the liberation, one way of describing it is just the giving up attachment. But it, both ways work here because once you give up attachment, then the vinyana doesn't arise in either. So there is liberation in that sense as well. But uh, it is practically an issue where meditators think of um, freedom as trying to not have to experience something. And in the short term, that's a bad attitude, even though eventually that is the that is the ultimate freedom with the experience of cessation. Uh, one, one, sorry, uh, yes. I didn't really get what the compound means here. Then, uh, aditana, bivin, uh, abhinivesa, musaya. Well, that's those those three words. That it's just it's a dwandva compound, or I think it's three things yeah. that are listed. So aditana is any determination in regards to it. Abhinivesa is any kind of inclination towards it. Anusaya is the potential for uh, 
the arising of some sort of defilement in regards to it, not just clinging, but also the other Anusaya, I suppose. You can have views about it or conceit about it. Anusaya is a nice addition there because it says, uh, of course, not just the arisen problems, but you don't even have the potential. The potential is gone because of the, the destruction of ignorance, the abandoning of, or the attainment of wisdom. So when in the Pali, they put together these three, it doesn't change the meaning of the three words? In this case, no, it's just a list of the three. Okay, thank you. So compounds, there's many different kinds of compounds. And mm-hmm. going by Bhikkhu Bodhi, that may make sense. This is just three things in the list. Saying good, one may delight and rejoice in that Bhikkhu's words. Having done so, a further question may be put thus. Friend, there are these six elements rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One, who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. What six? They are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the conscious element, consciousness element. These, friend, are the six elements rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One, who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. How does the Venerable know, one know, who, how does he see regarding these six elements, so that through not clinging his mind is liberated from these taints? Eight. Because when a bhikkhu is one with taints destroyed, and is completely liberated through final knowledge. This is the natural way for him to answer. Friend, I have treated the earth element as not self, with no self based on the earth element, and with the destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up and relinquishing of attraction, and clinging based on the earth element of mental standpoint, adherences, is based on the earth element, I have understood that my mind is liberated. Eric? Just a note on the word natural. It is nice. It's a nice turn of phrase, but it may instead just mean uh, according to the... It's anu dhamma, which means according to the truth or according to the dhamma. So he he answers not naturally necessarily. I mean, I'm not sure that naturally is what it means, but you can also understand it to mean uh, quite literally, according to the Dhamma, he, he will answer truthfully. I've treated the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, the consciousness element as not self, with no self based on the consciousness element. And with the destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up, and relinquishing of attachment based on the consciousness element of mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies based on the consciousness element. I have understood that my mind is liberated. It is by knowing thus, seeing thus, regarding these six elements, that through not clinging, my mind is liberated. 9. Saying good, one may delight and rejoice in that bhikkhu's words. Having done so, a further question may be put thus. But friend, there are these six internal and external bases rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. What six? They are the eye and forms, the ear and sounds, the nose and odors, the tongue and flavors, the body and tangibles, the mind and mind objects. These, friend, are the six internal and external bases rightly proclaimed by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. How does the Venerable One know? How does he see regarding these six internal and external bases so that through not clinging his mind is liberated from the taints? Bhikkhus, when a bhikkhu is one with taints destroyed and is completely liberated through final knowledge, this is the natural way for him to answer. Friends, with the destruction fading away, cessation, giving up, and relinquishing of desire, lust, delight, craving, attraction, and clinging, and of mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies regarding the eye, forms, eye consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind through eye consciousness. I have understood that my mind is liberated. But uh, all this um, desire, loss, delight, craving, attraction, and clinging are just loba, right? Or just one thing? Well, no, there can be 
something based on views. I mean, I guess you could still say that stanha or loba mulachita. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Third. With the destruction, fading away, cessation, giving up, and relinquishing of desire, lust, delight, craving, attraction, and clinging, and of mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies regarding the ear, sound, ear consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind through ear consciousness regarding the nose, odors, nose consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind through nose consciousness regarding the tongue, flavors, tongue consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind through tongue consciousness regarding the body, tangibles, body consciousness, and the things cognizable by the mind through body consciousness regarding the mind, mind objects, consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind through mind consciousness, I have understood that mind is liberated. It is by knowing thus, seeing thus, regarding these six internal and external bases, that through not clinging, my mind is liberated by the, from the things. Uh, Pante, when, when it says, yeah. and things cognizable by the mind through mind consciousness or etc. and other, is that, is that when, when a seen object is taken by the mind? as a mind object how is this different well there's three things there's the eye the eye consciousness and the mm. thing cognized the rupa light in this case oh yeah it's the object okay yes i understand now thank you saying good one may delight and rejoice in that bhikkhu's words having done so a further question may be put thus but friend, how does the venerable one know? How does he see so that in regard to this body with its consciousness and all external signs, eye making, mind making, and the underlying tendency to conceit have been eradicated in him? Bhikkhus, when a bhikkhu is one with taints destroyed and is completely liberated through final knowledge, this is the natural way for him to answer. Friends, formerly when I lived the home life, I was ignorant. Then the Tathagata, or his disciple, taught me the Dhamma. On hearing the Dhamma, I acquired faith in the Tathagata. Possessing that faith, I considered thus. Household life is crowded and dusty. Life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy while living in a home to lead the holy life utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on my yellow robe and go forth from the home life into homelessness. On a later occasion, abandoning a small or a large fortune, abandoning a small or a large circle of relations, I shaved off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and went forth from the home life into homelessness. Um, we have to uh, bring back the Sutta 51. I don't know how to do that quickly. I got it. Thank you so much. Having thus gone forth and possessing the bhikkhu's training and way of life, abandoning the killing of living beings, he abstains from killing living beings. <clears throat> With rod and weapon laid aside, conscientious, merciful, he abides compassionate to all living beings. Abandoning the taking of what is not given, he abstains from taking what is not given. Taking only what is given, expecting only what is given, by not feeling he abides in purity. Abandoning in celibacy, he observes celibacy, living apart, abstaining from vulgar practice of sexual intercourse. Should I continue? Yeah. Abandoning false speech, he abstains from false speech. He speaks truth, adheres to truth, is trustworthy and reliable, one who is no deceiver of the world. Abandoning malicious speech, he abstains from malicious speech. He does not repeat elsewhere what he has heard here in order to divide those people from this, nor does he repeat to these people what he has heard elsewhere in order to divide the people from those. Thus he 
is one who reunites those who are divided. The promoter of friendship who enjoys concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord, speaker of words that promote concord. Abandoning harsh speech, he abstains from harsh speech. He speaks such words as are gentle, pleasing to the ear, and lovable, as go to the heart, are courteous, desired by the by many and agreeable to many. Abandoning gossip, he abstains from gossip. He speaks at the right time, speaks that what is fact, speaks what is good, speaks the Dhamma and the discipline. At the right time, he speaks recording, reasonable, moderate, beneficial. He abstains from injuring seeds and plants. He practices eating one meal a day abstaining from eating at night and outside the proper time. He abstains from dancing, singing music and theatrical shows. He abstains from wearing garlands, uh, smartening himself with scent and embellishing himself with unguents. He abstains from high and large couches. He abstains from accepting gold and silver. He abstains from accepting raw grain. He abstains from accepting raw meat. He abstains from accepting women and girls. He abstains from accepting men and women slaves. He abstains from accepting goats and sheep. He abstains from accepting fowl uh, and pigs. He abstains from accepting elephants, cattle, horses and mares. He abstains from accepting fields and land. He abstains from going on errands and running messages. He abstains from buying and selling. He abstains from false weight, false metals, and false measures. He abstains from accepting bribes, deceiving, defrauding, and trickery. He abstains from wounding, murdering, binding, brig brigandage, plunder, and violence. May I ask quickly, what's raw grain? Uncooked. That rice. Okay, rice, thank you. wheat. I mean, it would have been rice, most likely. That's what they had in India. I don't know if they had wheat in India or other grains. So it's like he cannot accept it until it's cooked and it's um, offered to him, like in his bowl or something like that? Well, it's not quite so much that he can't. It's that he doesn't, uh, although it, it, it does carry over into, for, for bhikkhus, they, like, they shouldn't accept uh, raw food. The uh, raw, un things, uncooked food that needs to be cooked. Raw vegetables are okay, I think. Or, or raw grains that you can eat raw, like the rolled oats. Thank you, Bhante. In regards with what, with what we read earlier about the elements and aggregates and bases, if Buddha is neither of those, then whom do we worship when we say Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato? And understand that that's the Buddha. That's the problem. But if the Buddha is neither the aggregates nor the basis nor the well, the Buddha uh, is a concept, but it's not something outside of those things. It's just a concept. So do we mean that the aggregates of the Buddha are very pure? No, we mean the Buddha. Well, that's part of it, but that's not what we mean. We refer to the Buddha as a concept, just like when you say sabbe satta sukita untu. You're not wishing things for the aggregates. You're wishing things for the conceptual beings. Thank you. It's um, those those practices are not focused on uh, ultimate reality. They're focused on conceptual reality. Like when you give a gift to someone, you're not thinking about their aggregates. You're thinking about the person. There's, oh, so there's you... connections to there's connections to ultimate reality. The the connections are, are obviously there, and they're important important to make a connection. Like reference to the Buddha, you're you are acknowledging the ultimate reality of pure states of mind that you recognize as being the Buddha. Also, when you ask the question, "Whom do we worship?" you are already asking the question in conceptual reality because you use the word mm -hmm. "we." Whom do we? So you can't cheat and go back to ultimate reality. Then and the question also has "who," which is if you ask yeah. "who," then the answer is well, the Buddha, not the aggregates, are not a "who." Is a uh, uh, worship? I didn't think that that's a worship. Well, technically, it's a very good word, I think, because it means worthship. Buddha is worthy, but someone as being worthy. 
but it's just it's in Christianity, for example, it's used as, or in other religions, I guess, it's used to connotate uh, something a little different. But not really. I mean, even if we put the Buddha up as our our Lord, our Master, that's considered appropriate. If you if you consider paying respect uh, as a good quality or something uh, wholesome, Buddha is the one who deserves the most respect. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't, I didn't, I don't really understand the word then, uh, worship, because I thought, or in my language, if I translate it, uh, it's like I'm talking or I'm venerating a being that's actually somewhere in samsara or in heaven. So that would mean for me worship. Yeah, I don't know why it would be necessary for the being to actually be conscious of your, your respect. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything else applies. It's just there's not the consciousness from the Buddha, which doesn't seem to be important. Except, uh, I guess, in in other religions, there's a sense, like in the in the Jewish Bible, there's a sense that God likes it when you praise Him and when you give offerings and expects it and demands it and the jealous God and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, see, bitte. He becomes content with robes to protect his body and with alms food to maintain his stomach. And wherever he goes, he sets out taking only these with him. Just as a bird, wherever it goes, flies with its wings as its only burden, so too the bhikkhu becomes content with robes to protect his body and with alms food to maintain his stomach. And wherever he goes, he sets out taking only these with him. Possessing this aggregate of noble virtue, he experiences within himself a bliss that is bent blameless on seeing a form with the eye he does not grasp at its signs and features since if he left the eye faculty unguarded evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him he practices the way of its restraint he guards the eye faculty he undertakes the restraint of the eye faculty on hearing a sound with the ear, and smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with the mind, he does not grasp at its signs and features, since if he left the mind faculty unguarded, evil unwholesome states of covetousness and grief might invade him. He practices the way of its restraint. He guards the mind faculty. He undertakes the restraint of the mind faculty. Possessing this noble restraint of the faculties, he experiences within himself a bliss that is unsullied. Okay. He becomes one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning who acts in full awareness when looking ahead and looking away, who acts in full awareness when flexing and extending his limbs, who acts in full awareness when wearing his robes and carrying his outer robe and ball, who acts in full awareness when eating, drinking, consuming food and testing, who acts in full awareness when defecating and urinating, who acts in full awareness when walking, Waking up, talking. Possessing this aggregate of noble virtue and this noble restraint of the faculties, and possessing this noble mindfulness and full awareness, he resorts to a secluded resting place, the forest, the root of a tree, a mountain, a ravine, a hillside cave, a charnel ground, a jungle thicket, an open space, a heap of straw. On returning from his arms round, after his meal, he sits down, folding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect, and establishing mindfulness before him. Abandoning covetousness for the world, he abides with a mind free from covetousness. He, pur he purifies his mind from covetousness. Abandoning ill will and hatred, he abides with a mind free from ill will, compassionate for the welfare of all living beings. He purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. Abandoning sloth, sloth and topper, he bides free from sloth and topper. Percipient of light, mindful and fully aware, he purifies his mind from sloth and topper. Abandoning restlessness and remorse, 
he abides unagitated with a mind inwardly peaceful, purifies his mind from restlessness and remorse, abandoning doubt, he abides having gone beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states, he purifies his mind from doubt. Having been thus abandoned these five hindrances, imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion, with the stilling of applied and sustained thought, I entered upon and abided in the second jhana, with the fading away as well of rapture. I entered upon and abided in the third jhana, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain. I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindlessness due to equanimity. Mindfulness. Mindfulness. There's a, there's a difference. 19. <clears throat> when my mind was constant, <clears throat> when my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfections, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to impeccability, I directed it to knowledge of the destruction of the taints. <clears throat> Directly knew as it actually is, this is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is. These are the taints. This is the origin of the taints. This is the cessation of the taints. This is the way leading to the cessation of the taints. When I knew and saw thus, my mind was liberated from the taints of sensual desire, from the taints of being, and from the taints of ignorance. When it was liberated, there came the knowledge. It is liberated. I directly knew birth is destroyed. The only life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. It is by knowing thus, seeing thus, friends, that in regard to this body with its, with its consciousness and all external sign, I making, my making, and the underlying tendency to conceit have been eradicated in me. Saying good, because on one may delight and rejoice in that Bhikkhu's words. Having done so, one should say to him, It is a gain for us, friend. It is a great gain for us, friend, that we see such a companion in the holy life as the Venerable One. That is what the Blessed One said. The Bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu. 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 Uh, I think all the part that we read from the other previous sutta is actually included in the Pali here. Yeah, I don't, not all of it, but does skip a little bit of the jhanas. It's interesting, it skips a part that he doesn't skip in the, in the sutta. Um, in regards to one part of the, um, that we read from the 51, um, I noticed that it says that, uh, I guess a bhikkhu has to use always kind words and um, just pleasant, overall pleasant words when he talks. He can never, he can never use, use harsh or... So that statement is sort of one of these statements where you've read too much into it, I think. It's, just, mm -hmm. it's very common for people to say you must when the Buddha didn't say must. Mm -hmm. important to, to be a little bit careful about how you portray what the Buddha actually said. It's here he's talking, he's giving an example of someone. He says, he mm -hmm. does this. And it never says once, you must, he must. It was hard to imagine that always, like he abstains from harsh speech to speak such words as are gentle, pleasing to the air and lovable. But this is, the, this is an example. The Buddha uses this, this manner of speech often where he says, here monks, a monk, does this and this and this. And whenever he does that, and it's quite common, you should never translate it as a um, bhikkhu must do this, mm -hmm. or this is the only way, or something like that. There's no reason to, there's no there's no uh, base basis for doing so. When the Buddha says must, he means must. When he doesn't say must, you should understand it to be 
guy guidance. Of course, you should emulate this Biku. Does it mean that you have to always be like this Biku? No, not necessarily. Is that a Pali word for mass? Um, so I can recognize it if I see. And there isn't exactly, but there is a way of saying it. There's, I, I, I immediately think of the should, what one should do. The Buddha would often say one should not do this, one who does this is guilty of an offense, that sort of thing. can't think off the top of my head where it could be stronger than that. Okay, so anyone uh, with a question to Bhante, please ask your question. Um, can I ask a question about something we discussed earlier? Sure, sure. Uh, let's say we have an apple and I can see it, taste it, touch it, and um, smell it. Which experience is the true essence of the apple? Apple is not something that exists, so it has nothing to do with experiences. But you said that, um, let's say, seeing an object is the true essence of a, the object. No, it's not. Objects are not real. They don't have essence. I think you said something like this. I I misunderstood. If I, if I did, I spoke wrongly. Apple, there is just a perception, nothing more. It's called the uh, Ganasanya, like a solid, solidity. Like a, it's one of the things that uh, hinders uh, Vipassana, seeing things as solid things. Um, Bhante, if I may ask a question, it's related to um, Maj. I don't know how to say that. Um, Majima Nikaya 51, paragraph 17. Um, so he becomes one who acts in full awareness when going forward and returning, who acts in full awareness when looking away, uh, sorry, looking ahead and looking away, and then etc. that whole paragraph. So um, I made some notes to to check with you if my understanding is correct, um, because sometimes I feel like I I have understanding of the of what's what of what we're learning in Dhamma study, and then sometimes I feel like I I, I have doubts on my understanding. So um, I made some notes to try to um, say it as clearly as possible. Um, so. There's the mind, and from the mind, there's ignorance, and that ignorance um, comes thoughts of liking, disliking, related to the experiences. And because of that, there's craving and grasping and becoming, which can come in a, like a positive light or or negative light, like... Um, so in the sense that the craving, it's not always necessarily wanting, but while well, it's wanting of not wanting and things like that. Um, so then he is not mindful and he's not staying with reality as it is because it's tainted by the mind. And so he's not seeing clearly and seeing clearly would be that he sees everything is unsatisfactory it's not constant, it's always changing, it's uncontrollable, it's not self, and therefore, um, it just experiences is what is to be experienced, seeing is seeing, um, with no additional thought or action. So I, I'm sorry, I, I really, I'm having a hard time articulating it, but am I getting the right understanding? Am I getting a, a good grasp on or good sense or good understanding of that paragraph that we looked at 17 so so the paragraph is just about mindfulness of of your daily activities is it not yes so all, all of what you were talking about is more related to what's going on behind the scenes what's going on in the mind during the time that you're not mindful yes that sounds right i'm, I'm not i don't quite understand why you've picked that particular passage to discuss it, though? Um, I don't know. It's hard for me to articulate sometimes what's in my mind. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I, I could explain it very well, Bhante. <laughs> my apologies. Well, maybe just don't overthink it. Um, don't think too much. Keep it simple. Thank you, Bhante. Um, 
when we are aware of our when we are mindful of our daily activities is it um to develop a mind that is able to investigate real is it to develop a deeper concentration or is it um to understand the process of our activities mindfulness in daily life is no different from mindfulness during actual formal practice intention is the same to see clearly and come free from suffering so we are when we are aware of our walking i mean walking is an activity of the body we understand better the body when we are mindful of walking we understand better the three characteristics the nature of experience the body is not something you understand because the body doesn't exist you understand that the body doesn't exist okay about the the idea of must um i think what the, the sort of thing that relates to that is where the buddha says and i can't remember the exact wording but he says it's not it's not possible it cannot happen that one should uh, attain freedom from suffering without without doing such and such can't think of an exact example and uh, what is the pali word for that like it's impossible i remember that from the suttas impossible well there's the word ababo ababo which means it is not possible ababo gatung is one it's not possible to do mm-hmm. there are places where he says atanang atanang means there's no basis atanang bikave and where and he'll say tanang means that there is a there is a base for one who does this one who does doesn't do this there's no possibility etang tanang vijati a base is known it's it's possible uh in in regards uh, to what julie was uh, I guess asking um full awareness in that paragraph means uh, mindfulness right sampachan sampachanya yeah basically a part of wisdom Sati is, I mean, it's related to sati, but it's not sati. Sati is more of the activity that produces uh, the, the sampachanya. So is it like in, in um, uh, not so how you proceed is like you have this awareness and then afterwards with sati, you remind yourself what uh, what is what is the actual experience, right? Sati is like... Um, I think they liken sati to grabbing hold of uh, a sheaf of 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 grain and panya or sampajanya is cutting is the cutting of the grain that you're holding but it may be bit more like um if you're looking through a telescope sati is the holding the telescope perfectly still I guess you don't hold it or hold the telescope still or else you'll shake it but holding something very still and then being able to see because you're holding it very still It is what what keeps the mind uh, focused on the object. It's uh, closely related to Dhamma Vichya, right, Bhante? Sampajanya and Dhamma Vichya. Yeah, they're both ways of saying Panya, I think. Yeah, Asamoha Jetasika. Oh, it's Panya. Okay. I mean, they're used in ways that are a little bit conceptual. Like Dhamma Vichya, it kind of sounds like more of the process or the the general state of mind but technically it's referring to panya the interesting okay. thing about panya is if you think of it as asamoha jetasika then it is it's the absence of ignorance it's just the clarity of mind the absence of delusion it's important because okay. we think of wisdom normally as as intellect intelligence reason rational thought that's wisdom is something you can express it's not wisdom is not something you can express not this type of not the type being described here it's not something you can tell someone oh i learned this today and then they have that wisdom this this would be like um, clearly seeing gudaya bayanya right the rising and ceasing all these yeah any any of the stages of knowledge mhm any okay yeah that's wisdom of course delawar you were gonna ask something yeah Um, it's a bit unrelated, but now we've come to the stages of insight, so it's a bit related now. So I have a question about uh, Chula Sota Panabante. Do they have the same qualities during the, the, this lifetime, like a Sota Pana, and they don't break the five precepts naturally? 
It doesn't say, but that seems reasonable. I mean, if they broke the five precepts, they would be susceptible to going to hell, so it's likely that they are unable to. Thank you. Um, this, <clears throat> this doctrine of mind and matter being separate realities, and you can't reduce one of them to another, somehow against the natural tendency of the mind, because the mind wants things to be very simple. I mean, it wants to have one fundamental reality and you can reduce everything to that. And I think that Buddhism allows for more complexity that we are usually comfortable with. And I wondered if anybody had this experience in learning Buddhism that allows for more complexity than you are comfortable with. Buddhism doesn't allow for complexity. It's just uh, uh, teaching you things as they really are. Like if it is uh, complex, what to do? You want to? You, you yeah. can't lie for the sake of simplifying it. I meant that. I wanted to say that the mind, naturally, at least some the minds of some of us, want naturally want simplicity, and reality is more complex than we are. Yeah. We yeah, that's, like why the, that's why the religions that are like uh, uh, built around the concept of a God is uh, popular because it's very simple. If you don't understand something, it's God. It's nothing to question it, nothing to learn about it. Just uh, leave it all up to the God. That's very simple and quite comfortable. For example, when I learned about the or ultimate realities, the um, my natural tendency was, which one of these is the fundamental reality? I mean, well, the problem uh, isn't how many there are. The problem is how you take them. You take them as being entities, and you're looking for entities. And so it's not a question of how many. The mind and body are not entities. They're just um, aspects or descriptions. They're parts of reality or parts of experience. They're not things that exist. The problem isn't that there's one or there's two. The problem people have is, well, they're thinking of things, and if you're thinking of things, it makes sense that there's only one thing. But this isn't about things. This is about descriptions and accuracy and clarity. You, know, you Through the practice, you stop looking at reality as, as entities or things. So the four ultimate realities can be deceptive if you aren't practicing, because you think, well, those are the four things. They're not the four things, they're four aspects of reality or four categories of aspects. They're not entities. So a quick question. Um, so I, maybe maybe it's a very basic question, but this doctrine that um, with cause and effect, so there's no ultimate cause. Is there no ultimate cause for everything? I think it's related to what we discussed earlier. What would it mean that there's an ultimate cause? That, is, that sounds not like nonsense. I mean, Nearly something. things have causes and conditions. So let's say for the physical universe, our physical existence. So our doctrine is that you can go back in time as far as you want. You won't find a first thing that produced everything else, right? Depends on where you want to stop, like. You want to stop from your grandfather, then you can start from there. So if you don't want to stop, you can keep going back. But it will not, uh, it will not be the way to uh, find whether there's a first cause or not. I mean, it wouldn't even make sense to say that there is first cause because if there is a first cause, then why, why is it special than everything else in reality? I think for these kinds of questions, there will never be a satisfying answer. I also think that uh, uh, quite the opposite of what was being said, that Buddhism is about making it more complex. It's actually seeing how simple experience is and all this complex, complex of finding it is actually the problem. The meditative experience is actually simple. The problem is to make it more complex. Yeah, meditation should give you fewer questions. Surprisingly, I guess people think that the more you learn, you'll have new questions, but you actually have fewer as you go. I also thought that 
um, but I mean, it's like reality is simple. Like Austin, what Austin was saying just now, not that complex. But but I thought a little bit, and and I thought like you, a person really needs wisdom because you won't understand it even if you study it. Really, there are different components how this will make make it look like it's simple i think also depending on the person the buddha gave uh, either complex teaching or simple teaching something simple for example the story of venerable uh, uh, who was uh, just uh, told to rub a white cloth and that was enough for him to come to the realization the buddha didn't give him any Uh, uh, complex uh, sermon or instructions, just a simple instruction. But for other monks, uh, the Buddha would give very deep teachings. I mean, Im- imagine hearing this sutta from the Buddha. You know, it's not a super easy teaching. I think. Like, uh, I wonder if the monks who claim to become become our hands uh, try to memorize this sutta <laughs> to ask if somebody questions i mean like all this is in theory it can get as, as complex as you want it to get but that's all theory and, and it's a, i mean concepts can be co- complex what i meant to say is that experientially uh, delusion builds complexity and and wisdom points towards simplicity but point of experience is extremely simple and uh, the delusion is the complex part. So. Um, there are suttas uh, in which the Buddha presents uh, like a deep teaching but in a very simple way. For example, the Sabha Sutta is just saying monks I will teach all. Then he uh, talks about eye and sights and sounds etc. So that is all. There's nothing else. It uh, um, looks simple, but it is deep. In regards with complexity and reality being simple or complex, I think it's also a matter of how much you are able to deal with or the mind is able to deal with. Because doing meditation, my inner reality seemed very complex, overwhelmingly complex. And yes, it became... Came disengaged. No, I don't know which is the word, the word, the, the correct word. After my emotional baggage got le- lessened, but um, yeah, there's also a feeling of overwhelming complexity when you don't do meditation, and there are so many things to deal with in so many different ways. Well, the technique is simple. Whatever comes, be mindful of it. Uh, even I think this sutta says don't uh, pay attention to details uh, or what uh, perceptions. It- yeah, I mean it gets much easier and simpler when you do meditation. But I think the question whether a thing is complex or not in itself doesn't doesn't make a lot of sense because it's important. Um, the important thing is how much the mind is able to deal with reality and if you are not able to deal with something it seems complex and when we say that reality is simple i think that what we are saying essentially is that the mind is able to comprehend reality in without much diffic- difficulty if we med- if we do meditation bante you have used before the word um, aditana um, can you make some example of how we develop it in meditation well, there are many kinds of aditana it refers to your determination to do something or it, it can be a can be cultivated through verbal determinations like may i become free from stuff may i become free from defilements when you wish for all beings to be happy that's a sort of a determination it leads to the abhinivesa abhinivesa the inclination And for example, uh, um, when you meditate for a one hour sitting uh, in the you, um, you start the session and you said that you don't gonna move 
or this one is right. can develop it. Right, that's a determination. Mm. Thank you, Vante. Like the determination made by the uh, uh, Buddha before he attained enlightenment under the Moon tree, that he would not uh, move until he attains enlightenment, even, even if his body completely dries with the exact coat. And this one is because um, the movement is related with the concentration. <laughs> is that correct? I don't think he said specifically he wouldn't move. He wouldn't stand up, he said. Mm. He wouldn't leave his seat. Meditation, I guess, it's not, I mean, as a determination, to me, it's, it doesn't seem so important to reserve for not moving. It's more like, you know, if, if I would try to resolve for some things, you know, clarity or understanding or wisdom and things like that. Not so much not moving. Uh, like, um, I don't know, but if you don't move, um, it's like uh, you train yourself to maybe face other uh, uh, obstacle. Um, like, for example, uh, if you feel pain and... Uh, you know, you observe it uh, and you don't move. This one is kind of, uh, I think, I don't know, kind of um, kind of a training, no? I think there was a, like a t- some talking in the practice discussion channel um, about this. Uh, and someone, uh, Bante actually said that he heard a story where um, a monk injured himself and became a paraplegic. Uh, so, I mean, it depends, right? Like, uh, and he also said it wasn't related to meditation, though. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, for Vipassana, it's more like, I don't think it's about uh, not moving. Of course, it's it's great if you don't need to move, but if someone, something is hurting really bad, I think you should move. To me, it sounds a bit uh, radical if we say we don't move at all. Like, sometimes I notice my back is a little bit um, not in the best position, and then I reposition. Of course, I try to be mindful of that, but I think it's not necessary to, or I think we shouldn't say not move. Like, change position is a bit more proper to say, I think. But moving is, I think, not that bad. Um, For me, for... When it comes to moving during meditation, it helps me to see like the cause and effect. Like I, I'm mindful of the moving and um, is it coming from some kind of dukkha? Like, am I bored? Am I restless? Um, am I trying to distract myself? Do I want to be more comfortable? So it, it uh, helps me see more of like cause and effect. Uh, in- intentions, you mean? Or I mean... When we're talking about wisdom and seeing, there's always the temptation to think that consciousness is somehow different from the other aggregates or elements because yeah, the faculty of knowing, of being wise, it all they all have to do with consciousness. So I always have the thought that there's something special about consciousness. You think? What Bante was saying so applies to this as well. Like there are four different aspects to the experience, to reality, and that's it. None of those are any more special than you. I, I guess Nibbana is the most special if you want to choose one. Is that true, Bante? If we, if you want to choose one, is what true? Nibbana if, is uh, special. If you, is is that the most special? I think that's the most special. If we have to choose from Rupa, Chitta, or Chittasika, and Nibbana. I mean, they're just words. If you want, I mean, if you're using the word special, Nibbana has things yeah. about it that make it special for sure. It's the yeah. only exception to the to Dukkha and Anicca. So they are called the Paramatta Dhammas. So you have to figure out the meaning of the word Dhamma there. So it's, they are not like entities, but uh, they are distinct realities. Means they are not, not all one, they are distinct. I mean, if you are, you have to be careful not to start thinking everything is mind made or something. The word Dhamma is like complicated to 
translate to English. It's a phenomena. But, but if not everything is mind made, then how can Rupa see it if we relinquish the desire for Rupa? No, uh, in the, when you take the experience, it has the aspect of Rupa, it has the aspect of uh, consciousness. So that they are different aspects. Knowing of it is the duty of the action of the consciousness. It's not the act, uh, uh, function of the Rupa. They have different functions. It was explained to us, if this uh, could help you, uh, as like, it's it's like a, actually I forgot the proper, like it's a line worker. Can someone help me here? What was the, Austin, do you remember the simile, like uh, how each, the, each it's like um, workers in a line? So one, one just does one thing. So the, so the mind is one thing, like Sanka was saying, just knowing. And then other workers, workers take, take the same object and do their job and that's it. Yeah, I've lost the context in which I was speaking. So, like in a factory, there are uh, line workers. Um, I don't know the proper an assembly line. I think that's it. I I like to think of it as uh, like you drinking a uh, milk coffee. I mean, there's water there, there's coffee there, there's milk there, there's sugar there, but uh, you are tasting it. Yeah, you are tasting it, uh, tasting all at the same time, but you know distinctly that there's coffee there, you know distinctly that there's sugar there, but, uh, and, and they are not uh, the same, but it, that is not how you experience at that moment. And if, if, if the sugar is missing, you can tell clearly, without a doubt, there's no sugar. I mean, if you, if form can cease just by, abandoning of the desire for form doesn't that mean that desire is the cause of form desire, uh, rupa doesn't cease just because there is no desire then the mind's involvement with rupa so, is your it. question is just making things too simple asking about cause and effect is very complicated i mean but the um, you, you should <laughs> study the particular samupa the dependent origination how it goes Yes, that's what I was saying, that future future bodies, future rebirths cease if we abandon the desire for future, the thirst for future rebirths. Isn't that correct? Yeah, if there's, there is no uh, craving, there's no birth. There's no but birth, also, there's no arising. And since craving also, is... No, you also abandon moha, you know, ignorance. And ignorance. Not and abandon. You're free from ignorance, actually. Abandon. I mean, ignorance and thirst are mental, mental, mental. Yeah, phenomena. mental, mental, right. mental phenomena can give rise to physical phenomena. For example, if uh, you want to raise your hand, your hand can raise. That's a physical phenomena. So you you have the intention to raise the hand, and as a result, your hand rose. So. There you go, simple example of mental phenomena giving rise to physical phenomena. If you slap your uh, hand, you will feel pain and you will feel roughness. So that's a simple example for mental phenomena giving rise to physical phenomena. And if you keep, if you desire for food, if you keep eating, your body will grow fat. Another example. Yeah, about mentality, materiality, another that is very hard for me to understand is how can Nibbana be neither mind nor matter? Someone says something is hard for them to understand, it's usually a sign that they're trying to understand the wrong way. I mean, from a practice, practice perspective, in the context of, say, uh, intellectual studies, academic studies, it, it, that's not a wrong phrase to use, but in terms of meditation, in terms of Buddhism, you don't understand that you're trying the wrong way, or if it's hard to understand, you're wrestling with something that you shouldn't wrestle with. I mean, you should note the wrestling, the confusion, the doubting, not understood by trying harder. 
And the answer is more meditation, if I understand you correctly. The answer is see clearly, which yeah, comes from proper meditation practice. Thank you. Yeah, it's about, sometimes it's about seeing the clearly has to do with sometimes seeing clearly has to do with um, letting go of the the desire to know something, for example, realizing that it's just delusion that is leading you to want to know something that you don't benefit you wouldn't benefit from actually knowing the thing you want to know because I mean, what what benefit is there to know anything the only benefit is in letting go well if you know impermanence then you let go then you are able to let go yeah but it's not a thing you know uh, yes yes i'm not i didn't mean to say that there's nothing that you need to know but um, it's a different kind of needing and a different kind of knowing. So it's not a thing that you feel you need to know. It's just the, the truth is that when you are familiar enough with impermanence as an experience, then that's what's necessary to let go. There will never be a sense, oh, I need to know more of impermanence, or I, I can't understand impermanence, I wish I could. Those are those, That's related to attachment, the desire to know and that sort of thing. Worry that you don't know, confusion, that sort of thing. It's almost like these things travel on different mediums. Like the understanding doesn't travel on the medium of language, not content. Uh, it only travels on the medium of experience. So communication can travel in the medium of language. So that understanding cannot come from hearing or speaking about. It. Yeah, I mean, I think that doesn't quite do it justice. It's not just about a medium. It's about the type of knowledge, what is meant by the word knowledge in the first place. It's much more related to familiarity and experience. You mean if I desire and believe it is, it will be permanent. And somebody told me it would not, it will not be permanent then I would stop desiring that thing or the thing, the desire will become, will be much weakened, no? Well, so when even the parents the, tell their children, when parents tell their children something is bad for them, does it always make them want it less? If it were that easy, it'd be nice. If only, you would all be way ahead right now. Well, it's not that there's no benefit from getting knowledge from others, getting information from other people or even inspiration but it's not the same as it's not what is meant by wisdom mostly except in cases where there you know, wisdom is just a word so it can be used in different ways but mainly in buddhism it's used in a sense of familiarity clarity and familiarity so when we say final knowledge is does that mean ultimate knowledge it's a good question i wanted to look that up actually I didn't actually look up what the word final is actually in the Pali. If I can find also, it. Is, is... is that uh, also explained in the commentary what you were saying earlier about that, that uh, an Arahant will know that he's done what needed to be done, basically? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah it's referring to the knowledge of Arahantship. Is, is that uh, explanation in the commentary, Bante? What explanation? I mean that um, that knowledge of an arahant of uh, knowing the holy life has been lived. Uh, uh, sorry, what about that? I I don't know where to find that uh, in in like a text or something. Is that in the commentaries and where where or find find what? Um, maybe find what exactly? Find that statement. That statement I think is in many texts. Uh huh. There's a couple of, you may be thinking, or you may be looking for something like the, um, in the Anattalakana Sutta, I think, and the Adita Pariyaya Sutta. Those two have interesting, uh, well, fairly, fairly canonical or, or systematic, uh, I don't know, generic descriptions of enlightenment. Um, is the digital, digital Pari reader uh, does does it have the commentaries as well? No, right? Yes. It does. In English? No, in Pali, I assume. Yeah, yeah. You can you can when we're reading here, you can switch to the commentary by clicking on the A the A button. <gasps> it's in one of the suttas we did, I think. Uh, I remember uh, there was a sutta I can't remember the name. Uh, 
one mark was questioning how come how can these monks be enlightened when they haven't even attained the jhanas arupa jhanas and then they said they are uh, uh, panya vimutti or liberated by wisdom something like that it's really interesting that he uses final knowledge final is nowhere in this how does he do these things ah that's terrible really so so this is well okay not terrible but it's i don't understand why why particular as you all probably know for for literal translations which can cause you some trouble itself but there's nothing like final here the word is samadanya vimutasa for one who is liberated through right knowledge samma samma is very simple I mean, unless I'm missing something here. Samadanya. What else could it mean? I mean, it's samma is from samma. There may be something I'm missing. But no, the, I mean, the, the translation that we have from the CPED is having understood perfectly. So samma, samad, whatever it comes from, it must mean perfectly, not final knowledge. Anyway, it's not like it changes the meaning of the sutta or anything, but it is kind of it's kind of a strange phrase that we don't hear very often. So yeah, it's it was something that came up as a question in my mind. Final knowledge. I wonder what the translation of mean. that is. But it just means um, perfect knowledge. I think more literally, just means right knowledge. Maybe final means that you can't go any further with knowledge. Yeah, it's just that. I mean, it's not that it's wrong. It's just that it doesn't say that. As far as you I can see, that's not what the text is. You can translate it in the digital Pali dictionary as perfect uh, understanding if i'm assuming he's the one who no, translates no. it no oh okay the, in what the, the which dictionary digital poly dictionary that's not biko bodhi oh okay who's that Pante? um well that's uh i can't remember who it is i don't really know him but he's he's popped up as a monk who's doing really good work that mm. i get emails from him every so often okay thank you Samad, yeah, well, let's see if I can find it in the commentaries. We are able to search for commentary terms. Samadanya. Okay, it looks like we have a translation, a commentary on this sutta itself. Samma Anyaya, it just means right knowledge. Samma, samad comes from Samma, which is obvious. I mean, that's what you would immediately think. I don't know why you would come to final when it's quite clearly come from Samma, and the commentary confirms Samma Anyaya. Although if it may come from the commentary explanation, Kim Wutang Hoti, Kandanang Kandatang, Ayatanang Ayatanatang, Tatunang Tatunang. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's nothing to do with final. Sambe Sankara Anijati Eva Madin, Vabedang Samma Yatha Bhutang Anyaya Janitwa, Tiriyitwa, Ulayitwa, Vibhave Twa, Vibhutang Katwa. It's a really good explanation, actually. Uh, what is? How do you translate "atta" here, meaning uh, Self. something like defines, defining the ability to define the kandas as the kandas in regards to the kandas, defining them as kandas. Kandat, kanda nang kandatang. It's very concise. In regard, uh, no, the knowledge of the meaning of kanda in, of aggregates in the of the aggregates. The uh, no, the yeah, the not the. I'm not sure quite how to translate that directly. It's it's pretty clear the meaning though. In regards to the ayatanas and seeing seeing them, knowing them, or having the understanding of them. Datu nang datutang, the meaning of datu of the datas, datus. Dukasa ilanatang. Hmm, that's interesting. Oh yeah, the the not the meaning of oppression of suffering. Samutayasa pabhava tang pabhava pabhava meaning the that which creates so in of the cause now he's going in so the first part of this was talking about the the aggregates the ayatana and the datus the elements then in regards to the four noble truths in regards to oppression or the meaning of oppression means knowing the the Essence, Atta is like essence, kind of, or it can be. So, in regards to of Samudaya, the cause of the origin, the meaning of, or the, the essence or the nature of being that which causes Nirodasa Santatang, the peaceful essence of Nirodha cessation, and the Magasa Dasanatang, the, the seeing, 
the meaning of seeing of the path. Sabe sankara anichati eva mading wa vedang or, and he gives an alternative for what could be meant by sama, sama anya, right knowledge, having known, having known, having judged, having weighed or examined, having made clear, having made distinct by the knowledge, having made distinct, uh, having known, having judged, having weighed, rightly, I'm not going to translate this perfectly, rightly, um, through this, through division, through breaking it up into pieces, yata bhuta, as it actually is, starting with the truth, thus all sankharas are impermanent. So, I mean, basically, seeing sabbe sankhara nicha, sabbe sankhara dukkha, sabbe dhammanata, with wisdom as it actually is, and uh, being able to discern that. This is what is meant by samadanya. So there's never, I mean, it is referring to the final knowledge. I'm just not sure why he would translate it like that when that's not the word that was used. Right knowledge. So right is important in the sense of, as we've been talking about, it's not intellectual knowledge, it's not um, rational rational thought knowledge, like that comes from processing it's right knowledge in another sense, in the sense of actually experiencing and becoming familiar for yourself. What did we correct to say that um, meditation, passion for liberation? It would be correct to go by what the texts say. We're really confident in the text. So. It leads to seeing clearly and that leads to uh, disenchantment. This enchantment leads to this passion. Right, I have to go. Thank you all. Have a good week. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.